We want to welcome you to our 11.30 a.m. Wednesday luncheon Bible study from, Birmingham, from Doctrinal Studies in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we are currently in a study out of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 30, called Grieving the Holy Spirit. That's taken from Ephesians 4.30, as you well know. Uh, what is interesting is a greater passage, Ephesians 4.25 through 32, is our greater passage in that is where it says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now, what is important, and we've been talking about this over the past, I, I, this is lesson number seven. I have one more lesson. I'm going to close this series down. But we have been discussing this whole great, greater passage on grieving the Holy Spirit because Paul talks about a lot of things that grieve the Holy Spirit in verses 25 through 32, and, and we've looked at all of them, uh, and, and it's really important that, that you understand that. Now, one of the things that we discovered in our studies, it, from verse 25 through 32, in, in that section, there are 11 imperative Greek imperatives. Now, an imperative in the Greek language is a command, as a command, you're commanded, there are 11 of them from verse 25 through 32. There are 11 of them. And we've pointed them out as we've gone along, if you've paid attention. Uh, last week in verse 31, we looked at the 10th. And in verse 32, we look at the 11th, <coughs> excuse me, one today. And what we're going to look at today what we looked at last week in uh, verse 31 were the six deadly sins of the old man, Cosmos Diabolicus, lifestyle. There were six sins listed, uh, and we talked about that last week, that, the, that the, it should not be in the Christian life. And when they are, it's evidence of old man cosmos diabolicus thinking behavior. Now, that's really important you understand that. <clears throat> it's very important because after you are saved, you still have a sin nature. And the evidence of your sin nature is personal sin. It walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. And, uh, and then we're warned by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 to walk by faith and not by sight. That's a distraction from the will of God in your life. And who would distract you from that? Mm, the devil. Now, we distract ourselves a lot as well, so we don't blame him on everything. But the guy who runs the real show against the plan of God is the devil in the world. 1 Corinthians 5.19, the devil is the God of this world. But that's with a little G, of course. Well, there's a third part to this whole thing. I, I call it a third front that has to be one in the Christian life, and that's his former way of life. The Bible has a great deal to say about your former way of life. Your former lay, way of life should not be interfering with your born-again lifestyle, and yet it interrupts our life in a great deal many ways. And these six deadly sins mentioned in verse 31 come from the former life that is still present in the Christian life after salvation. The, these things have been embedded in our psyche, in our soul. And we haven't dealt with them properly and efficiently. Well, today we're in verse 32, and he's going to give you the spiritual antidote for grieving the Holy Spirit through these sins of the old man, these former manner of life sins that are still present in the Christian life. And so we're going to talk about that today. That's in verse 32. So if you have your Bibles, if you would, turn, turn in your Bibles, and then I'll have a word of prayer with you. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles, Ephesians 4.32. Listen, you should always come to my Bible studies with a Bible, a pencil, and a piece of paper, i.e. a notebook. Now, we do give printouts, 
you can usually go to our website and when you study this, you can go to the notes section, pull down the notes. And, but if you don't have them, then I expect you to write down things that I think are important. And I'll tell you what I think they're important. I put them in points and, and principles. But, but here's verse 32. I'm going to read verse 31 because 32 summarizes 25 through 32. Let all bitter not, he, he, where he mentions the six deadly sins of the former life that is still present in the Christian life that disrupts the plan of God in your life. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, he says, must be put away from you. And then he says, along with malice. Now, I explained that last week, but just let me call your attention to the word all that's used twice. He mentions all bitterness, wrath, anger, Notice as he goes through the list, he begins with let all bitterness, wrath, anger, slander, slander be put away from you. And then he comes back and he holds this with all malice. And I talked about that last week. I showed that how, I mean, and I compared it to Proverbs, uh, the sixth chapter with the six deadly sins there. Uh, to give you an idea of Paul's mindset, in my opinion, Paul's mindset about this subject matter. Now, here I am in verse 30. Two, and he begins with a conjunction and, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now, I want you, I want you to look at two things in there. They're going to they're gonna tell you something about the six deadly sins in verse 31. You're going to miss them if I don't point them out to you. Because most of you read the Bible and don't pause and let the Holy Spirit read it back to you. When you study the Bible, you should read it. And then you should pause and ask the Holy Spirit. Let him teach and recall the word of God to your life. John 14, 26. You should allow him. He indwells you to teach you the truth of the word of God. He is called the spirit of truth. You should let him when you read the Bible. Read a passage. Pause. Ask him to in interpret it for you. Well, this is how I get this stuff. He says, be kind, watch this word, to one another. Now, he's talking to Christians about others who are in personal relationship with you of some sort. We, in the church, we call it having fellowship. Personal relationships could be with your wife, your children, uh, employees, this is, you know, one another. Whenever you're in a one another situation, one with another, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, watch this, each other. See, these are personal. These are sins that are involved, in former sins in your life that are affecting your present relationships with people in, in the Christian life. Oh, please tell me you see that. My goodness, people. Be kind. Notice he's going to mention three things. Kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. I call it the triad virtues of the new man. And these deadly sins interrupt in personal relationships, which the Christian life, that's what it's all about. Being able to have an influence upon other people, both unbelievers and believers, for the unbeliever, uh, having enough influence over them so that when you give them the gospel, it, it, there's credibility from your life to it. Well, here, let me show you how this word, how verse 32 is in the Greek language. The word be and be kind. The word be is genomai. Now, pay attention. It's a present act imperative, second person plural. Second person plural is y'all, everyone I'm speaking to. He's talking to the Christians. Become, and it means this word genomai, remember now it's a present active imperative, that's a standing command. This word genomai is interesting, words to be or to become, means to become someone you weren't required in exchange. Now, you'd have to go back to verses 20 through 24 of Ephesians 4 to understand what Paul is talking about. 
remember that when you do go back to Ephesians 2, 4, verses 20 through 24, that's one Greek sentence. That's one complete thought when you read it. Well, he says, be, become, become, become something you weren't in 31 because these, these sins interrupted your life in personal relationships. You, the bitterness erupted, anger, wrath, sl clamor, slander, malice. It shut, shut it down. So be, which is a present active, be kind. You're commanded to be kind. Don't be bitter, be kind. Be tender-hearted, forgiving. That's how you're supposed to behave. That's new man, divine viewpoint thinking and behavior. This is what the Christian life's all about. Stop being this and start being this. <coughs> See? Let all bitterness, raft, anger, clamor, slander in verse 31 be put away from you. That's a command to be put away from you. I told, I told you that means to be lifted up and removed from your life. Bitterness, you got it. Hebrews 12, 15, you got to get back to the root. You got to dig it all the way down to the root and get rid of it. Well, now, I'm going to show you another thing else. Remember that in verse 32, it's to one another and each other. It's about personal. It's personal relationships. I want to show you one other thing in there. Watch this. Watch how, watch how he closes that. Just as God, be kind, tender, and, and forgiving. Just as God in Christ also forget, for, what, uh, has forgiven you. Just as also. Just as also. Just as also. Just as God in Christ. Right? Also has forgiven you. Be forgiving. Say be be kind, tender-hearted, forgiving. Forgiving is the key to being kind and tender-hearted. Forgiving. 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 See that word? That's a participle, and it comes into an infinite, uh, into an uh, indicative in this Greek language. Forgiving just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And the word you is plural. It's y'all. Second verse plural. Well, that's where I'm taking you today, the each, each other. That is, in the church, that's the body of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 through 27. And you should read verses like 25 and 26. When one, suffer, when one member suffers, they all suffer. When one is honored, they're all honored. That's the unity in the body of Christ, which can't have it when you got these kind of six deadly sins. A little leaven, leaven's a whole lump business. Well, remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it, nor can you live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Personal sin. Could be mental attitude type. Could be sins of the tongue, overt sin. You can go back to verse 31 and get a look at some of them that have been embedded in the Christian life from the former life is still present in the Christian life and disrupting relationships well what how do i get out of carnality first corinthians 3 1 through 3 how do i get of carnality and back to spirituality the indwelling ministry of the holy spirit flowing through my life in a natural normal way how does that work confession of sin i like first john 1 9 because of one word i'll show it to you in a moment if we confess our sins that's not the key word for me it is a key word, though, confess, because I've got sin in my life. What do, how, what do I, and, and carnality has resulted from it. How do I get out of carnality to get that sin taken care of is the only way I can get out of carnality. If I confess my sin, here it is. He, God, is faithful and just to forget the God in Christ is faithful and, and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. That's my key word. It goes back to verse 7. It takes me to the cross of Jesus Christ where the blood of Christ is shed for the forgiveness of sin, past, present, present, and future forever. 
See, when I confess my sin, I'm cleansed. As far as the east is from the west. That's a marvelous idea, is that not? I got it as salvation. I get it every time I confess my sin. I got it from Adam's sin. When I, as an unbeliever, the, the gospel that Jesus died for my sins was buried and raised from the dead. And when I believe it, Romans 1.16, it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Therefore, I'm saved by grace through faith and not of myself. It is a gift of God, not of works. At least any man should boast. So when I come to the cross, I get the blood of Christ works for my salvation to take me from Adamic sin, the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin, into the positional truth that in Christ, I'm a new creation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But for the Christian life, when I, when I get into carnality, I don't need to be saved again. I need to be spiritual again. How do I do that? I confess my sins because the blood of Christ works in the Christian life through confession, not through belief. Isn't that marvelous? If you're out there today and you've never believed the gospel, maybe you've never heard the gospel. You've heard that people, you ought to invite Jesus into your life. You, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But you never knew how this is done. Listen, it is done this way. He, you've got to believe that he died on the cross for your sins, past, present, future. Not only the sins of your former life, but of your Christian life. Think about some of the sins of your former life that was completely wiped clean that are still present, embedded in your soul in the former way of life because of the old man way of thinking that are still present, even though the blood of Christ took care of them in your salvation, they're disrupting your Christian life and have to be dealt with by confession. But listen, confession doesn't remove the, the, the old man former way of thinking. It removes the sin, but not the thinking. You've got to root these out. You've got to, he says to the Christian, verse 31, you've got to lift them up and remove them. And he, and he tells you how to do it in the fourth chapter, verse 22, 23, and 24, by three infinitives. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet. So thankful for the internet today, Father, for the COVID has shut down in many ways and uh, reduced the size of attendance of a church. The pastors have had to become very creative in a way to do it, and I thank you, Father, we have through the internet to keep our people fed the word of God, to keep them marching forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ into the community to keep their life compatible with the will of God on a daily process, I'm thankful for it. And for the team through John Dyer and his staff that really do a marvelous job with us here at Doctrinal Studies, I thank you for this. Bring us, Father, to the truth today of the new man triude virtues that Paul describes as be kind, tender-hearted and forgiving. How important. These are the things that should replace the six deadly sins are these three things. Be kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving. Are we that kind of people, Father? When other people abuse us and misuse us and, and treat us terribly and persecute us uh, for Christ's sake, Are we kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving as, as forgiven? I pray that would be true in my life and all of the people that hear us today, and we'll tell them how in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I've got three points <clears throat> on verse 32, and then I'm going to come back next week, and I'm going to close this series up. You, to understand the dynamics of what Paul is talking in 31 and 32, you really have to be familiar with what went on from verses 17 through 22. And I've, I've taught you that, and I've talked about it, and I've explained it to you. Especially verses 20 through 24, 
which just precedes verses 25 through 32, my study. And now we're down to the triode virtues of the new man. Paul says, be kind, tenderhearted. And the word, listen, when he puts that command at the front, he commands you to be kind. He commands you to be tenderhearted. He commands you to be forgiving. He commands you. He doesn't request it. He doesn't think this would be a great idea. He commands it. He commands it in the church. He commands it in the life of, the, of a born-again believer. So what I want to do is I want to go back and I want to review because last week's lesson is so important to this week's lesson. I want to be sure you really understand it. I want to give you a brief summary of my last week's lesson that is so important for this one. And I would, I would encourage you, if, if all of a sudden you dropped in on, on this lesson and didn't have the other ones, that you go back and study them. They're, they're, they're sequences of, of 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me, let me just take a moment with you and go back and look at some things. I got, I got four ideas from things we learned from last week. One thing that we, first thing we learned from last week was that old man cosmos diabolicus, old man is former way of life, cosmos diabolicus is the system that, of the devil that we bought in to think that this is the way the, our life should be lived. Then we come to Christ and we find out, mm -mm. like Paul, like Paul in the third chapter, uh, what's I once, what I once thought in my former life was gain is, is now lost. And what I consider to be lost is now gain. The Christian life I thought was a loss, and now it's a gain. I persecuted that whole way of life because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was a loss in life. Well, you should go back and read Philippians 3, it would, it, would be my, it would be helpful. We learned that old man cosmos diabolicus, cosmos the world, diabolics the devil, the devil's system, like in 2, Timothy, like in 2 Corinthians 2.11. Don't, listen, Christians must not be ignorant of the schemes and devices the devil uses uh, to trap us, 2 Timothy 2.26, to do his will. Is that possible? He got Peter. Matthew, the 16th chapter, 21 to 23, he got Peter. Uh, one, of the inner, one, of the, one of the three inner disciple circles of Jesus Christ. Jesus had to say to him, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. Uh, Luke 22, 31 and 32, he said to Peter, listen, the devil has been granted permission from the Father to sift you like wheat. I'm going to pray for you that when you, when, you, when you recover, you will know how to strengthen your brothers properly because you don't know it now. Did you know all that? Well, you do now because I just taught it to you in a brief moment. We learned that old man cosmos diabolicus sins are manifestation of one's former life before salvation, a system of thinking a system of thinking, a cosmos diabolica system of the old man, former way of life that are still present in you. And Paul refers to them in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 in that one Greek sentence. Old man, cosmos diabolica thinking. And these are the things we learned before our salvation. Point number two, and the things we might have learned while we were in our, while we're in our salvation because we don't pay attention to the Word of God, who's feeding you information? Who is, who is feeding you daily? If it's not the Word of God, man cannot live by bread alone. He needs every word. Bread versus the Word of God. Here's point number two. We learned that every, believer's, every believer is commanded... To put away, the word is iro. 
Iro means to be lifted up and carried out. Lifted up, I say, lift up and remove because that's the idea. These six deadly sins that he talks about in verse 31 means to be lift up and removed, and that's a command. Iro is a command in verse 31. It's a command on these sins that Paul mentioned, former manner of life sins. This involved more than the confession of personal sins of 1 John 1, 9, because they were embedded in a former way of life that's now still present, thinking of behavior and disrupting personal relationships in the Christian life. They were embedded sinful ways of thinking and behaving. We learned that last week. Point number three, the third thing that we, we learned from last week's lesson is that Paul had earlier in Ephesians 4 explained how to exchange, how to exchange the former life, the old man cosmos diabolicus system of thinking and behaving to a new man divine viewpoint system. He talked about how to make that exchange work. He talked about it in Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. He laid it out in one Greek sentence. And he said there were three, and he did it in infinitives. He said, you've got to lay aside your former sins. You've got, lay, lay, you got to lay them aside. That's the idea of lift up and remove. That's an infinitive. That's in verse 22. Then he says, that's the first step. You got you to take them off. You got to lay them aside. You got to remove them. You got to lift them up and remove them. The second, the second step is an infinitive that says, you've got to renew your mind. You got to renew your mind. Renew your mind from cosmi, cosmos diabolicus to divine viewpoint. What does the Bible say? What does the word of God say? What is the will of God for my life? What is, how was God directing me, the directive will of God? That's, listen, that's, that's all about Romans 12 too. Don't be conformed to the world, cosmos diabolicus, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, divine viewpoint thinking. That you might prove what the will of God that is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's Romans 12 too. That's, that's, this is what we're talking about. There's an exchange. First, I've got to take off. I've got to renew my mind to the word of God. What does the Bible say? What is God? What is God's will for my life? How is God spelling it out? Point one, point two, point three for my life. Then I've got to put on. Take off, renew, and put on. See? See? Take off, that's 422. Renew, that's verse 23. Put on is verse 24. Put on the new man. Divine viewpoint thinking. You got to know this stuff. I mean, many of you, your life is all a mess because you've got certain sins embedded in you. Now, listen, Paul talks about some of these embedded sins in in Ephesians 4, in Colossians 3, he talks about more of them. If you're interested, that's a, that's a parallel passage. Okay? So we put on. Now, what he's talking about today in verse 32, 432, is what we put on. What do you put on? What, what do we put on? Okay, if I'm to take off bitterness, anger, wrath, slander, what do I put on? He says, kind, tender, kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness. The, whatever you take off, you got you to put something on in his place that's based on the foundation of the word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith is what you stand on. Faith is how you operate. Faith is how you fight the good life of faith. Point number four is the fourth thing we learned that I think is really important for you today. To get my lesson today, you've got to have that foundational understanding. Doctrine built on doctrine. 
black upon black upon black. If you go to school, you study 100, then you study 200, then you study 300 and 400, and then you start to teach at a 500 level. When I say doctrine built on doctrine, that's what I'm talking about. The foundation, up and up you move in it categorically. Point number four. We learned there were four fronts and three fronts. There, there were three fronts uh, to win in the Christian way of life. You got to win over the flesh. You got to win over sight. And you got to win over old man cosmos diabolical thinking. You got to win them. I mean, it's, there's no doubt about it. We talked about that. I got to make some changes here. Three fronts that have to be won in the Christian way of life. You got to win over the flesh. Galatians 5, 16, 17. You got to win over the flesh. The flesh is the sin nature. That lust to sin. Sin nature, lust to sin. J James 1, 14 and 15. Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh, James 1, 14, 15, is personal sin. It's self-pleasure. Even sins like bitterness. Why would you erupt them? Why would you allow them out of the cage to bite and devour another? You know, Paul talks about, listen, you people are biting and devouring one another. So how do I win over the sin nature? How do I win over the flesh, the cravings of the flesh? Gluttony, drunkenness, all those kind of things. How do I win over the flesh? That's an understanding. But how do I, how do I, how do I beat it? I got to walk in the spirit. If I walk in the spirit, I will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. These two are in opposition to the Christian life. What do you do? You surrender the flesh to the Holy Spirit. You let him be the master. If you give in to the old sin nature, then he's the master. You need to read Romans 6, 7, and 8. Can't do it all today. Then you got to win over sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, you walk by faith, not by sight. Sight. What is sight? It's the... It's, it's the cosmos diabolica system of how you resolve things in your life, how you justify being bitter, how you justify being angry and just flip out and blow your lid. Let it spew all hot, let the hot water spew all over everybody else and burn them. And why you got that in your life? Well, it's a form of way of life. Well, now what do I do? You dig them out and get rid of them and replace them with something that's positive by the word of God. Listen, there are three things that will correct the six things that he's mentioned. All you got to do is put them off by the renewing of your mind to what the word of God says in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, 25 through 32, especially 31, 32. And to put on then put, put off, renew, get in the Word of God. What's the Bible say about what you need to put off and what you need to put on? This needs to go, be put off. Dig it, dig it out, pick it up, and remove it. Take it to the junk and throw it away as far as the east is from the west, never to return to my life. And what do I put on in its place? What do I plant in the place of the shrub that was dead? these deadly sins. What do I do? Well, I, I put on tender. I put on tenderness. You understand? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. That sounds so easy, doesn't it? It is. 
But what you got, when should I, when should I, listen, first you have to realize when you're in a relationship and bitterness and wrath and anger and slander and all that comes out of you, clamor comes out of you. And other people are like, I don't need this. I don't need this in my life. I am out of here. Doesn't that ring a bell that something's wrong? That that's not the Christian life? That that's not Jesus Christ? That's you and its worst, worst exhibit of manifestation? And you go like, I hate, I hate it when I do that. Then change it. I don't know how. Stick your head in the Word of God. If you will come and study one year with me, pick out a day. Pick out a day or go to the website and pick into a series and study it. Be with me a year and your life will never be the same. But you got to commit to something. Listen, you're, you're already committed to the former way of life. And it's wrecking. It's a wrecking ball in your life. And not a good way. Every time you're trying to build something up, out comes a wrecking ball and knocks it all down. How many relationships do you have to go through and burn up before you realize, now I'm telling you that you can get rid of that. You've got to lift it up and remove it. You've got to dig it out like Hebrews 12, 15, bitterness. You've got to dig it out at the roots. You've got to dig all these. They're embedded. They can weather storms. Listen, it's embedded. You think they're gone every winter, and the next spring they're up. Now you go through seasons like that. Well, I, I think I must have whipped it just by uh, power of thinking. Boom, spring comes, there it is. That which you thought was gone is back. Boom, 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 the wrecking ball. Ah, geez. Went over the flesh, the sin nature, went over sight by faith. I walk by faith and not by sight. Went over the old man like in our passage here. Stop walking in the former man of life and start living in the dynamics of the regenerated life, the life in Christ, the dynamic life, the new man divine viewpoint thinking life. Well, that's what Paul talks about. Stop being conformed to the world and start being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hello, people. I tell you, you need to write this down. Listen, I took two, two sessions to teach that to you. I should take a bunch of sessions. But listen, you've got to study it. You've got to go back over and over and over that and deal with it. Look in a mirror and deal with it. My, my, my. Well, point number two. <laughs> Today's lesson. Today's lesson text shows how the exchange and replacement put away old man Renew your mind, put on the new man. See, there's an exchange and a replacement. Now, you must understand that. Verse 31, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. What's he take? Lift up, dig it out, move it out. Take it to the dump and leave it. In its place, put new shrubs in. Be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving. Got to have new shrubs. God wants them replaced. He wants the old removed, and he wants the new planted. Watered and productive. See, that's Ephesians 4.31 to 4.32. In 4.31, Paul listed five old man sins that must be lifted up and removed from your life, from the Christian life. These are the deadly sins because they're embedded and they destroy. They're a wrecking ball in personal relationships. Whether it's in the church or out of the church, they're a wrecking ball. Every time you try to build something up, boom, out comes that fit of anger. You don't know why. They don't know why. It, all of a sudden, boom, there it is. And everybody around you has learned to walk on eggshells because you won't change. And you won't change because you listen, I understand it. You don't know how. You do now. 
It's not just taking them off and, and reforming, but really have life-changing transformation where you take off and replace. You take off bitterness, anger, and wrath, and all of that, and put on kindness, tenderhearted, and forgiveness. You put something on that's productive for God. This is God's will. Where do you learn God's will? From his word. You ought to find a pastor and a church that teaches the word of God. You wonder why your life's a wrecking ball? You go to the church that they give you yeah, yeah, rah, rah, and you leave all fired up and you haven't got a thimble full of information to walk by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God in Romans 10, 17. Now, you people should know this. And you people listening to me certainly should know it. And if you haven't known it today, up to today, you know it today. And it's time for change. It's time for exchange. This is very clearly brought out when you look at 31 and 32. In verse 32, we have these words to one another and each other. <laughs> you see, bitterness is, is one thing to be bitter within oneself about oneself, but it never stays there. It's one thing to be angry within oneself about oneself, but it never stays there. Or wrath, or slander, or clamor, or malice. Never stays there. No, 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 it's a wrecking ball. It's Satan's way of just keeping your life a mess. The former way of life run by the, the cosmos diabolicus system the devil runs in, in uh, 1 John 5, 19. No, I know. You would want to go to church that tells you that the devil is not real. <laughs> the fact that you would even carry that a thought Shows you it's real. My, my, my. Jesus said it to Peter, get behind me, Satan. What was he talking about? He was talking about the way he was thinking and behaving. Let me give an example of these old man cosmos diabolical type of sins that are embedded in the Christian's life and affect personal relationships. The Bible is full of examples. <laughs> Listen, I could, I, could, I could spend the rest of my life in the book of Genesis with the examples God has given us. The book of Genesis. Never leave the book. Because once we get into personal relationships, Adam and Eve in the garden, Cain and Abel outside the garden, and then... The list goes on from there. You have tons of examples of what I'm talking about today. But I want to take you to one that hits close to home to a lot of people. Young people, newly married, middle married, older married, people who are in intimate relationships, and how these deadly sins can get embedded and affect your life and your witness for Christ. Okay, you ready? Here's one. This is one that really David and Michael's love relationship. David beats Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. Saul wants to keep this young whippersnapper that's become an icon in Israel at a very early age. He's, 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 he's got all of the tools at a very early age of being somewhat, someone for God. When he killed Goliath, we knew that. So did Saul of Tarsus. So did uh, Saul the king of Israel. So he put him on his staff. He wanted to keep this kid close to him where he could keep an eye on him because 
if this kid has any ambition, he's going to have to, he's going to, have to contend with him. The good thing is that young David had ambition, but not for anything that Saul had ambitions for. Saul was old man, cosmos diabolicus. David was all about new man, divine viewpoint thinking. He had aspirations for Christ, not for himself, nor for who he could become, what kind of medals he could wear, or, or promotions, or, or name dropping in his life. And Saul took him and put him in his staff, and he found out that everything this young man touched, God, God prospered, just like Joseph in Egypt. And it wasn't long that, the, that there was a song made for him as almost a national anthem. Saul, Saul kills thousands, but David kills ten thousands. Now Saul is worried. When a song of the national anthem, the most the pop song that stayed the longest on the charts was that song. Not only that, that Saul, out of desperation, made a commitment to the army of Israel that anybody that could go out and fight Goliath, uh, he would bring them into his uh, family relationship that they could marry one of his daughters and be connected, be connected. You know what I mean? Connected with the king and the throne and, and that prospect. Somebody reminds the king that this young guy, David, has killed Goliath, and that's up for grabs. Something happened while David was in grooming. The king was grooming him. That there were two young guys that were being groomed. The one was Jonathan to be, was being groomed for the next king. David was being groomed just to keep an eye on him because he was a real threat to the throne uh, with a guy who's got twisted beliefs. He's got old man cosmos diabolical thinking embedded in his soul. And what he found out that soon these two guys being groomed become the best of friends and, and they dearly loved each other. By that I mean they would have been willing to sacrifice each one life for the other. They both went through the military academy together and they were bonded. Jonathan loved him like a brother and, and David loved him like a brother. In military terms, that means to sacrifice your life for another. In that relationship inside Saul's family came this idea of David could. So Saul makes all kinds of attempts to do some of that stuff. David, David and Michael have got a relationship going on, and that relationship's growing. It's becoming a love relationship. And so David calls in his chips. David says, hey, I understand that. Yeah, he says, yeah, but I don't give my youngest. You have to take him in order. No, nah, nah, not interested. Well, if you want her, you're going to have to go get me a bunch of foreskins, Phil Philistine foreskins. And David comes back with an unbelievable number, 100. Now we got another song hitting the charts. And so he gives him Michael in marriage. And this is not going to be, now he's really connected to the throne. Now what am I going to do? This bitterness, anger, wrapped old man thinking in Saul. Saul attempts on David's honeymoon tries to assassinate him. And by honeymoon, I mean the first several months of your marriage. Not that one week or three days or whatever. I'm talking about the first year of your honeymoon. You know, that first year of marriage. He tries to kill him. He sends assassins to kill him. Michael rescues him. Michael rescues him. 
and takes the heat for it. And David becomes a fugitive until he becomes the king later in life. He becomes a fugitive. And because Michael helped David escape, Saul annulled her marriage with David and married her off to another man. And the first thing you know, David, in his heart, has become Saul. He became bitter, resentful, vengeful. You know, vengeance is mine, say the Lord. Now, we don't realize all this until we read. We, we started in 1 Samuel 18, and then I went to 19, and then I went to chapter 25. Several years have passed, and David has now become king. And now we're in 2 Samuel, the third chapter. And there's still a member of the house of Saul left, a crippled boy, Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth, Ishbosheth. And he is told by the general, by David's general, that David requests. That Ish, that Ishbosheth bring Michael, who has now been married for years with family, to David, because she belongs to David, and David wants her. Not because they love her, if you read the passage. Not because he loved her anymore. Because he belonged. She belonged to him. Well, it's worth your read in 2 Samuel, the third chapter. In the sixth chapter, she's now in the harem of David. And she's become bitter. David's bitter. She's bitter. And the Bible says something really tragic to, to her life. She would never believe with David that She's going to remain childless. Never going to have a baby. Isn't that something? An heir to the throne won't become from her and David. Here's my point. Saul bitter, bit them, and the poison of the bite got them, didn't it? David became bitter. David bit her. She became bitter. The very thing that David hated, he became. The very thing that she hated, she became. Bitter. All connected to a former way of life. And nobody stopped. In this family of believers, nobody stopped to take it off by the renewing of their mind and put on what should have been. How should have David treated her after it was annulled and she was married to another man, went off, had a life developed for years and years, and David went on, got married, and yeah, 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 yeah. How should have he treated her? Tenderness. They were both victims. But listen, it's one thing to have someone make you a victim. It's another thing to stay one. You don't have to stay a victim one day, one hour, one minute. Because Christ has made you a victor. An overcomer. 
You don't have to be a victim. You may be one, but you don't have to remain one. You don't remain one. What do you do? You take it off. Renew your mind. What does God say? Then put on. Be tender. Be kind. Be forgiving. Be forgiving. I mean, what should have David done? Well, this is, this is exactly what he should have done. This is what Paul would have told him to do. This is what God says you must do. Point number three, Paul listed a triad, three things, of new man divine viewpoint that are virtues of the spiritual mature believer that the antidote over the old man cosmos diabolical system is working in your life. The antidote is working. I mean, how do you know if it's working? Because it's taking care of these sins. It's rooting them out. It's removing them. It's lifting them, carrying them off. It's putting in its place new shrubs. Virtues. What should have David done? Here's what he should have done. It's what you should do. It's what I should do. What we all should do just as also. Look at verse 32. Ephesians 4.32. I'm going to close this up. Look at that verse. Just as also. Just as also. Look at that verse. In your Bible. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. See, also brings that out of the scripture and into your life. These former way of life sins that are in your life that disrupt, they're a wrecking ball. You can shut that whole system down and you must, you must remove it, dig it up and get rid of it. In his place, plant new shrubs. Be kind, be tender hearted, be forgiving, be forgiving just as also. Just as God in Christ forgave you, also you forgive others. As my grandfather used to say, it's, Ronnie, it's not brain surgery. It's just common sense. For me, this is just biblical sense. This is not brain surgery. This is not difficult. You may think it is when you hear it because you never heard this kind of teaching. This is the teaching of the Apostle Paul. This is not my teaching. I didn't come up with this. This is nothing new. This is as old as the scriptures that Paul taught. My, my people. Remember, what has to be replaced is new man divine viewpoint virtues in place of old man divine, cosmos diabolical sins. Don't let them be a wrecking ball in your life. They are if you got them. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you, my friend, if you've got any of these embedded in your, in your life, and let me tell you, you have. Just like David, a man after God's own heart. You got to. Pick them up and remove them. You got to get them down to the root. Get all of it. In its place, plant new shrub. Be kind, tender hearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ forgave you, you forgive others. Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth as, as, as it is His responsibility not only in my life, but their life, to teach us the truth, and the truth will set us free, John 8, 32. It will set us free from the cosmic system of lies and the things that are like a wrecking ball in our life. Every time we start to build something in a relationship, boom, there it is. I mean, who would want to stay around this kind of a wrecking ball relationship? Just another person with a wrecking ball. They will play wrecking ball, reckon ball uh, games with each other. What a tragic 
what a tragic tragedy. Just two people consuming each other with no, no winners, no victors, only victims. Help us, Jesus. Encourage our hearts. Teach us the truth and may the truth set us free. In Jesus' name, amen.